Yes, there was a brief flurry of excitement on the right this afternoon when CBS News was first to report that the U.S. Justice Department had started investigating the discovery of classified documents found at a think tank called the Penn Biden Center. This is effectively where President Biden had his office in Washington after serving as vice president in the Obama administration. He vacated offices there effectively when he declared his run for president in 2020. But the Penn Biden Center is sort of the Biden home in D.C. in terms of his work life out of office. Well, on November 2nd, lawyers for President Biden, lawyers who work from him in his personal capacity, were reportedly packing up some of the office space that the vice president used at the Penn Biden Center. In so doing, they found classified documents there, classified documents that they say were in a locked closet inside those offices, mixed in with some non-classified documents. This is, of course, a weird set of circumstances, but that's what they say happened. The White House has since confirmed the basics of this account, as have other news organizations after CBS News was, was first to break the story. The reason this created a lot of excitement on the right, briefly tonight, is that it immediately created a perceived whataboutism defense for President Trump. President Trump is under federal criminal investigation for, apparently— deliberately hoarding hundreds of classified documents at his home in Florida, including refusing to hand them over after National Archives told them he had to, even after they subpoenaed him to get those documents. So there was this sort of brief excitement on the right tonight that they thought they had a new defense, right? Oh, it's supposedly so bad what Trump did at Mar-a-Lago with all the nuclear documents and stuff. But look, Joe Biden's just as bad. Why aren't they serving search warrants on President Biden the way they did on former President Trump? As I said, tonight, a, a brief flurry of excitement on the right about this prospect when this news broke about the Penn Biden Center. The reason it was only a brief flurry of excitement is because in President Biden's case, uh, he and his lawyers appear to have actually done the right thing when it comes to these classified documents. Um, Biden's lawyers say they discovered these documents among his vice presidential papers at his office at the Penn Biden Center on November 2nd. The White House Counsel's Office then notified the National Archives that same day about what had been found. The National Archives apparently did not even know these documents were missing and had not been seeking their return. The, arch the archives took custody of that material the following morning, and that appears to be it. Attorney General Merrick Garland has asked one of the last remaining Trump-appointed U.S. attorneys to review the discovery of these documents at the Penn Biden Center. But it does not sound like it's an adversarial process at all. Uh, the White House says it is cooperating fully with the National Archives and with the Department of Justice on the review. And again, this was not as it was in Trump's case, the archives desperately seeking the return of materials that Trump was blowing off and, and Trump was blowing off those requests and then ultimately blowing off the subpoena to return all those documents. These appear to have been documents that were inadvertently held at the Penn Biden Center, discovered by Biden's attorneys. They notified the White House, which notified immediately the National Archives that these documents were in the wrong place. The archives moved immediately to retrieve them. That appears to be the sum total of it, at least as far as we know. But again, the White House says they are cooperating fully with the archives and with the Justice Department on reviewing the situation. Again, we will bring you more on this if we learn more about it tonight. But uh, the brief euphoria on the right that this would somehow you know, exonerate Trump by whataboutism, uh, it's already turning into a bit of a hangover because of the stark contrast between the actions of the current president and the former guy when it comes to classified material. There's another provision in this deal, though, that I think is kind of a sleeper, that I think is worth more notice than it has received so far. And that's the provision as part of the new rules package that the Republicans are agreeing to, which would create a, a committee to investigate what they call the weaponization of the federal government. This is a committee that's expected to be chaired by Trump Republican J Jim Jordan. Um, and the Republicans claim that this committee would have the power to oversee not just the Justice Department and the FBI the way they're usually overseen by Congress. They claim this committee, led by Jim Jordan, would have the ability to oversee ongoing criminal investigations being conducted by the Justice Department. Ongoing criminal investigations, like, say, the ongoing criminal investigations into the January 6th attack or the ongoing criminal investigations into former President Donald Trump. 
One member of Congress who says he should be considered for a spot on this committee is Scott Perry, a Trump Republican whose phone was recently seized by the Justice Department as part of their investigation into the January 6th attack. This one, as I say, I think is the sleeper. If Republicans do go through with this committee to try to create a new system of oversight of the Justice Department that includes their ongoing criminal investigations, I mean, we can't expect that the Justice Department wouldn't just roll over and go along with it. We could expect that the Justice Department would presumably go to court if need be to protect their investigations. But what would happen then? I mean, what what would happen if two branches of our government went to war over active criminal investigations into a former president that could potentially put him in prison? What if it gets left to the pro-Trump conservative supermajority on the Supreme Court to settle that conflict? As I said, the rules changes, we'll see how they plan out in terms of which pose the most serious threats to sort of regular order and normal small d democratic governance. But this effort to try to get members of Congress into the criminal justice system in this specific way, that's, by my bet, really the one to watch. Joining us now is Timothy Snyder, professor of history at Yale University. He is the author of, among many books, um, the bestseller On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century. Professor Snyder, it's a real pleasure to see you. It's been too long. Thanks for joining us tonight. Very glad to be with you. Um, in terms of how tyranny works and how authoritarianism works, um, I'm a little bit worried that I'm seeing this through too American a lens, and I'm seeing all of this recent American precedent for the sort of thing that we saw in Brazil this weekend. Should I be looking at this with a wider and more international lens, that this is the sort of thing that authoritarian movements and far-right movements do all the time? This shouldn't echo January 6th so much as we should see it as a typical right-wing fascist pro-authoritarian tactic that people use all over the world. Well, I, I think you're right to, to point to the evident similarities between January 6th and, and January 8th. But I think both January 6th and January 8th, as you suggest, are about larger trends, too. One of them is the, to discredit institutions. When you storm institutions, when you show you can make yourself physically present in institutions, when you break windows, when you, when you, when you trash the place, what you're showing is symbolically, physically, that institutions don't matter. What matters is force. What matters is is will. And that, of course, is the is one of the oldest, one of the classic anti-democratic or anti-rule of law moves. You show disrespect for the institutions physically. And then all that seems to be left is the possibility that a person, a strong man, something besides these institutions should be running the country. If we can humiliate the institutions, then we get the strong man. And that, that's a logic which is on display here in Brazil and in the U.S., but it's also a classic logic. And then likewise, a lie, an alternative reality, a strong belief among lots of people that what happened is not what happened, that we didn't really lose the vote. You know, we really won the vote. That's common between January 6th and January 8th. But it's also a, tw a big 20th century, 21st century phenomenon, big lies which capture lots of people. But with the recent twist, and I think this is true of both Brazil and the U.S., that it's social media bubbles which allow this to happen. I think there's, a, there's an odd way in which the people who are storming these buildings are kind of emerging from alternative reality into real reality as, as they do it. And they're sure they're right because they're not hearing any other voices in the social media reality where they live. In terms of um, contending with the kind of tactical power of those things that you're describing, and think in terms of standing up for democracy, trying to protect democracy against these kinds of forces and attacks, how much does it matter um, that there is swift accountability for the people who participate in it and the people who organize it? One of the differences between January 8th in Brazil, January 6th in the United States, is that we saw a lot of arrests um, in Brazil, and that we've got a sitting president who is the successor to Bolsonaro saying that those who participated in this and those who organized it will be held accountable swiftly and, um, and, and surely. What role does accountability in the legal system, the criminal justice system, play in fending this off as a tactic against democracy? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in the comparison is absolutely right. And I'm, I'm very pleased for the Brazilian government that they were able to react so quickly 
um, it's very important that people who try to carry out this kind of fascist move are aware that the law also has force beside it. One of the things they're trying to do is monopolize force themselves. They're trying to say, we are the ones who control violence. We intimidate you. We intimidate the law. We're going to do something which is so strange and confusing and violent that you, you won't know how to react to it. And there was a bit of that in the U.S. on January 6th. It was so strange and unexpected and violent that the people just, the, the criminals just walked away from the crime scene. That's odd. We didn't, we didn't see that in Brazil today. And it's really important. It's really important because things like this, they're kind of a test of force. The, the people who are on the far right, that's what they believe in. They believe in force. And if they don't meet any force on the other end, then they're going to continue. And that doesn't mean that the people who are defending law should be unpredictable. It means that they should be predictable. It means that they should be confident that something like this is a crime and that the pictures like the ones we're seeing, where if you commit a crime, you go and destroy property, you commit all kinds of crimes, that you might just be, end up on a bus, you know, handcuffed, that that's normal. The democracies, because the story that fascists always tell is democracies are weak. They won't fight back. They're flabby. They're decadent. And I think it's pretty important for democracies to, to be able to say, no, actually, we, we stand for something, and that's something we stand for is law. I think that that point that you just made, too, is very important about how there is a tactical impact to seeming unpredictable, chaotic, weird, strange, um, and that treating these things as as crimes, among other things. And, you know, and, and accountability is a is an important concept. Um, but among other things, using the criminal law to respond to things like this has an effect of rationalizing the experience of what the country, what the country has just been through, of imposing uh, not only order in terms of people being held accountable, but also a framework of understanding that this is a crime. This is something that exists within our system. It does not destroy our system. Our system itself can handle things like this. I think that's mm -hmm. I think that's a that rationalizing force is an important insight. Yeah. And that we're all equal before the law, that we're all yeah. equal before the law. You know, that any of us does something like this. It's very, I mean, this, you, you were asking directly about Trump. It's very important for a democracy not to have these superheroes or supervillains who are judged by different standards. It's, it's very important that executives and former executives be subject to the rule of law, because once you start developing a legal theory according to which they're exceptional people, that little loophole will just grow bigger and bigger all the time. Timothy Snyder, professor of history at Yale University, the author of, among many other books, uh, On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century, which is uh, mandatory reading that you must do before watching The Rachel Maddow Show in any regular way. Uh, professor Snyder, thank you for your time tonight. It's good to see you. Thank you. However surprised we might have been as a country when that happened in January 2021, the American right wing had been showing us for months all over the country that that's the way they plan to operate from here on out. I mean, in 2020, they sent armed mobs out to government sites in, in Michigan, in Idaho, in Pennsylvania, in Oregon, in Arizona, in Georgia, you name it. And they sent them into state capitals. They sent them to the offices of statewide officials. They sent them to the homes of statewide officials, always with guns, always with force. And now, even as the national expression of this tactic in Washington, D.C., January 6, 2021, even as that has been successfully adjudicated in federal court as an act of sedition, and as upwards of a thousand people have been criminally charged for their participation in, again, the national version of this tactic from January 6, 2021, now we are starting to see how this looks when this American right-wing tactic gets translated into foreign languages and foreign countries. It was only last month when German police arrested more than two dozen people who they say were planning a similar armed right-wing attack on the German parliament. They were well-armed. They were fairly well-connected. One former member of parliament from a right-wing party was among those arrested. It was thought that her access to the parliament building as a former member might have been used to get these armed attackers inside the Reichstag on the day of their planned assault. Now, this month, it's Brazil, where Trumpy right-wing former President Jair Bolsonaro lost his bid for re-election on the last day of October. The time frame is almost exactly the same from when Trump lost re-election in early November 2020, and then his supporters attacked the U.S. Capitol the first week of January. 
Bolsonaro lost re-election the last day of October, and now his supporters have attacked the national capital the first week of January as well. Bolsonaro, uh, like Trump, said in advance of the presidential election that the election was rigged, that the only way he could lose is through fraud. Like Trump, Bolsonaro said in advance that he would only accept the election's results if he won. Like Trump, Bolsonaro then lost, and like Trump, Bolsonaro then refused to concede. He also refused to go to his successor's inauguration, just like Trump did. When Bolsonaro's supporters attacked their national capital yesterday, it was like watching a Southern Hemisphere Southern performance, Southern Hemisphere summer performance of the, the January 6th attack. The images and videos coming out of the Brazilian capital were so uncannily similar to what we saw here at home. And the pro-Bolsonaro mob attacked journalists and stole and smashed journalists' equipment, just as the pro-Trump mob did on January 6th. The Bolsonaro mob used police barricades as battering rams. They attacked police officers in bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat. They ransacked the offices of members of the Brazilian government. They took selfies and posed in government chambers. Just like Trump did, Bolsonaro waited silently for hours as the attack was underway. He only put out a statement calling for peace once the security forces had regained control of the capital and repelled the invasion. Bolsonaro's family and supporters, just like Trump's, uh, soon started claiming that it wasn't them at all who attacked the capital. It was bad guys. It was left-wingers. It was Antifa criminals dressed up like Bolsonaro's supporters. It wasn't really Bolsonaro's supporters who did all of this ransacking and who trashed the Capitol. I mean, the, the parallels are so tight, it's almost stupid. It almost just seems like reading the same script in a different language. And, and seeing, you know, English language hashtags uh, trending online about the attack, seeing English language signs at the attack in a country where they speak Portuguese, not English. I mean, it tells you something about how this may be more than just inspired by what happened here in our own right-wing attempt at a violent government overthrow. But there's also some important differences. Like, for example, in Brazil, they actually arrested people on the day of the attack. More than a thousand people arrested yesterday, unlike our own capital attack on January 6th, in which almost no one was arrested until well after it was all over and most of the attackers had gone home. In Brazil's case, they've got more than a thousand people in custody today from yesterday's attack. Also, in Brazil's case, they launched this attack a week after the transfer of power had already happened, not before the transfer of power like happened with the Trump supporters in D.C., because the new president of Brazil has already been sworn in and Bolsonaro is already an ex-president, that has all sorts of implications for the former president, Bolsonaro, and whether he's going to be held responsible for what his followers just did. Bolsonaro, bizarrely, is in Florida right now. Since the day that he left office, he has been staying at a weird little suburban McMansion near Disney World, which he rented from a mixed martial arts fighter. Okay. The State Department spent today fending off requests from reporters about what exactly Bolsonaro is doing here. Is he here to try to avoid prosecution on the numerous corruption probes and other forms of criminal investigations that he's facing in Brazil? The State Department is fending off questions today about, you know, what kind of visa Bolsonaro's on and what's going to happen if, in fact, he faces charges at home and Brazil asks the United States to extradite him to face trial there. We're also tonight learning... That even more weirdly, um, the official in the Brazilian government, who is the security chief specifically responsible for security in Brasilia, in their national capital, he was also in Florida at the time the attack on the capital happened this weekend. He has since been fired from the Brazilian government as of today. What was he doing in Florida when the attack took place? Why is he still there now? We have a lot of challenges. But on top of it all, we now need to contend with the fact that at least Florida appears to be developing as a refuge for would-be dictators for whom the violent efforts of their supporters were not quite enough to keep them in power. Florida is apparently lousy with that kind of overripe fruit right now. And we need to contend with the fact that whether or not the world still sees us as a beacon of democracy, a city on a hill... 
the far right around the world apparently now sees our far right as a model for violent mass attack against the institutions of government. I mean, as Americans, we take great pride in leading the world in lots of things. We do not take great pride in this.